Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a hot, overcast, humid Wednesday afternoon of Chem 1105 with your host, me, Dr. White. I don't know about you or you live, but my lawn and bushes and everything got some needed rain in the last couple hours. Thank goodness. All right. Let me remind you, tomorrow, Thursday, I will send out around 8 a.m., maybe even a little earlier, the password for test number four PDF file. You'll have until Friday, 4 p.m., test four, you'll have till 4 p.m. to upload your answers to Blackboard, the assignment area. Test number four will be on acids and base and organic chemistry. Look at the email, look at the announcement for the point breakdown. Now, what I would like to do today is first of all, remind you, hand in your labs. We're almost done with the semester. You have to get them in or you're gonna get zero points for labs. That's gonna hurt your grade. Now, if you look, my eyes, see how they're slightly red? Not really. I've been grading labs all day. Sometime by tomorrow, I will upload the scores for all labs that were handed in on time. By Saturday morning, and I'll send out an email, I'll go back and check any late labs, and I'll grade them. I'll upload everybody's scores to Blackboard. And when I send out that email, I'll ask you to check Blackboard. And if you see in the grade book, your grade book, a lab you handed in that hasn't been graded, then send me an email and I'll look for it and get on it. Or if there was a problem, I'll let you know. But that will be Saturday morning. I've got a lot of catching up to do. All right. Let's now, today's game plan. I will do the review for test number four. I need to get that figure fixed. One of these, oh, did it again. And after that, I'll go through the organic problem set. And then after that, I'll do some more problems on acids and bases and organic chemistry. That will help you for test number four. All right, let's get going. All right, on your screen, you should see Chem 1105 te review test number four. And this is in the lecture section of Blackboard, both as a Word document and as a PDF file, and you can download it at your leisure. All right, let's go things through things you should know for test number four. First of all, what's an acid? And an acid is a proton donor. What's a proton? H plus. What's a bronsted lorry base? Any proton acceptor. Therefore, if I give you an acid, a uh, proton, I'm an acid. If I say, you give me your proton, I'm a base. Now, here are the structures of acids, some key acids, not every acid or base, but some key ones you should know the structures of. You should be able to identify HCl, H2SO4, HNO3 as acids. By the way, that's hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid. You should be able to identify as bases, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, ammonia. And there's one I forgot on there. Add Dr. White. Hold on while I get my tablet. It'll be quicker to use my tablet. And the one I forgot. Which is sodium bicarbonate.
which you know is baking soda. And the red can, if you buy Calmet, which was my mother's favorite brand, and guess what? Mine too. And there are others too. Baking powder. And you should know these are all bases. Sodium hydroxide, NaOH, KOH, potassium hydroxide, ammonia, NaH3, and sodium bicarbonate, NaHCO3. Now, because of the dissociation of water, it reacts with itself, and this is called an equilibrium, a small amount of H3O plus hydronium ion OH minus hydroxide ion are formed. And the ionization constant, KW, named after me, I wish this was long before I was even born, discovered, is you should know hydronium ion concentration, when it's in brackets, that means concentration, times hydroxide equal, oh, I forgot to do this. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. Now, if you go to a different temperature, this changes slightly. Now, I want to point out something important that you should review. And that's important information, test number four. This file, what you're seeing on your screen, is also in the lecture section, and it will also be on the last page of test number four. And notice I have here the ionization constant of water, hydronium times hydroxide equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And as I said many times already, I have cut way down on the amount of memorization you have to do. You can all say, thank you, Dr. White, now. No, you don't have to. All right. Let's get back to our review. Now, you should know what is an acidic, basic, and neutral solution. An acidic solution is where the hydronium ion concentration, H3O plus, is higher or greater than the hydroxide. And a way of remembering it is this. And I hope you all know the math symbol for greater than. This means if I can spell it right. I think I've told you I'm the first one down to spelling bee. There, I got it right. So when the hydronium ion concentration is greater than hydroxide, you have an acidic solution. A basic solution, sometimes called alkaline solution, like your alkali bat alkaline batteries, are alkaline, basic in that battery. There, the hydroxide concentration is greater than the hydronium ion concentration. And finally, a neutral solution is when hydroxide and hydronium ion concentration are the same, equal. Now, I think you all know two lines means equal. And this is something you should know. Again, acidic solution, hydronium ion greater than hydroxide, basic solution, hydroxide greater than hydronium, and neutral solution, hydronium equal to hydroxide. Well, when you have numbers like 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 7th or whatever, that's not easy to figure out which is greater than the other. And somebody came up with, one of these days I'll have to find out who I haven't yet, the pH concept. And that's a small, it's the pH scale. I'll never ask on a test what the pH scale is in words, but it's a small number, scale of small number that's used to specify 
the molar hydronium ion concentration in aqueous solution. And it's defined as pH equals minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. This is an important information, test number four. Thank you, Dr. White, you're welcome. And my special gift to you is when the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus X, pH is X. Let's see if I put that important information and notice I even put that important information, test number four. Boy, I'm being too nice to you people. I gotta get mean and tough and nasty. But anyways, you should know how to do this. And we went through practice problems and I'll probably do one or more if we have time today, even though we've done it already. Now, you should know the pH scale. Hold on, let's make it official. This is probably one of the most useful things I'll teach you this whole semester that you can use the rest of your life. Hint, know this. pH scale goes from 0 to 14. At pH 7, it's neutral. See, it even says it on your screen. Now Dr. White's being sarcastic. Oh, it's Sarcastic Wednesday. I don't know if it is sarcastic. It's awful humor Wednesday. When the pH is below 7, it's acidic. And when it's above 7, it's basic. And that's something you should know. Now, the lower the pH, the more acidic a solution is. The higher the pH, the more basic, higher above 7. If I have a solution that's 11, another is 13, the second one is more basic. Now, one quick thing, the pH of your stomach is acidic. What is the reason why it's below seven? Because there's an acid in there. That's the Chem 1105 reason. If you take Chem 1212 with me, organic chemistry, I'll teach you how the acid in your stomach, which makes the pH below seven, breaks down your food, but I don't do that really in this class. I just don't have any time. All right, next, you should know about buffers. Buffers are solutions that resist major changes in pH when small amounts of acids or bases are added to it. I will never ask on a test, what is a buffer? But if you go back and look at practice problems for pH for acid, uh, chapter seven, you'll see I ask question like, uh, uh, beaker water is pH seven, and you add a small amount of dilute acid, what happens to the pH? Well, if it's a buffer solution and you've added a small amount of acid, the pH does not change. And as you did in the lab, uh, I taught you about titrations. And the important thing about when you're titrating, you're trying to find the molarity, you know, that's moles per liter, moles per thousand milliliters, the molarity of an unknown base or acid by adding a certain amount of a known molarity acid or base. And for monoprotic acids and bases, which all we'll ever do in this class, at neutralization, that's when the pH indicator, remember you used the phenothalian, you put a couple of drops in when you did your titration or with vinegar. When the color changes, you're at neutralization. At neutralization, moles of acid equal moles of base. And because of that, milliliters of acid for monoprotic acid times molarity of acid 
equals milliliters of base, monoprotic base, times molarity. And this class, I'll only give you monoprotic. Now, if you have something that's diprotic, two acidic protons, you got to modify those equations. Now, once again, let's look at important information, test number four. And notice I have titrations at neutralization, moles of acid equal moles of base, milliliters of acid times molarity of acid equals milliliters of base times molarity of base. And we went through some of these, and I recommend you go back and look at this for or at the problem set for chapter seven. Now we got into my home court, here on my home court now, I'm an organic chemist. And when we talk about organic chemistry, the most important thing is the carbon atom. All organic molecules are made up of carbon atoms and other atoms. And the first thing you should know is there's always four bonds to carbon. Four, hold on. Let's do this on full screen. How many bonds to carbon are there? Four. Four. Did I tell you I'm ambidextrous? Look. Four. 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 Does it look like this is coming at you? It should. Four bonds to carbon. You should know that. Now, I'm not going to ask you, but it's neat to know carbon can bond to itself. It can combine, com uh, bond to other elements, including itself, and it can form chains and rings, chains with and without branches and rings. Now, you should know, what is a hydrocarbon? A hydrocarbon is a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. When you take organic chemistry, there's a lot of memorization. Thank you, Nuvia, for the thumbs up. All right, so a hydrocarbon is a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms. There are two types of hydrocarbons you should know. Saturated hydrocarbons. Well, if it's a hydrocarbon, it's a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms. What makes it saturated, <clears throat> excuse me, what makes it saturated is it's a molecule in which all carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. Now, unsaturated, the UN gives it away, tells you because it's a hydrocarbon, it's a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms, and it contains one or more carbon-carbon multiple bonds, which you could also say contains one or more double or triple bonds. And if you remember yesterday, I showed you how a molecule with double bonds makes carrots the color carrots are, and a different molecule with double bonds make ripe tomatoes the red color ripe tomatoes are. By the way, I had a nice salad today with uh, romaine lettuce, carrots, so I was thinking of double bonds and tomatoes and double bonds and onions, thiols, but I'm an organic chemist. Next, we talked about functional groups. And functional groups are groupings of atoms in a molecule that have similar or same chemistry. What I asked you to know how to do, not to find what is a functional group, but how to find a functional group. And you look for anything that's not a carbon atom, hydrogen atom, or carbon-carbon single bond, and that's gonna involve the functional group. By the way, in organic chemistry, that's where the fun is. Remember, everything I'm showing to you, you can download from Blackboard in the file, in the lecture folder that's cleverly named Chem 1105, Test number four, review. Now, I taught you how to draw 
organic molecules. We didn't really go through parentheses that much, and that won't be on test four, but I showed you how to do condensed structures. Let's do one real quick, just to remind you. Uh-oh, I've got to open up my whiteboard. All right, there's my whiteboard. And what you should know how to do, oops. Is put in the hydrogen atoms. Guess what? I'm gonna let you have some fun, then I'll do it. Put in the hydrogen atoms in that molecule, three points each. And when you're done, answer yes. And please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. Don't forget to say yes, vote yes when you're finished, please. If we were face to face in a classroom, I would tell the class as a sign, when you're finished, look up and smile. And it works too. All right, let's get going. How do you know how many hydrogens to put on each carbon? There are four bonds to carbon. So if we look at this carbon, there's one bond. Four minus one equals three, because there's always four bonds to carbon. So I'll have three hydrogens. We look at this carbon and this carbon. They also have one line or bond to it. So four minus one is three. So each one of those have hydrogens. Now we're getting into some good stuff. We look at this carbon, how many bonds to it? Lines, one, two, three. There's always four, four bonds to carbon. Four minus three means equals, I'm gonna write a hydrogen. No, write a number. I got hydrogen on the brain today. You put one hydrogen. Hope you're all not seeing spots in front of your eyes. Oh, they're all gone. All right. And this last carbon, how many bonds to it? Lines one, two. How many bonds to carbon? Four. Four minus two, isn't the math hard? It is two. So that means there's two hydrogens. And that's how you draw a structure. Now, I talked about cyclic organic molecules, the so cycloalkanes, and every bend in a line is a carbon. Now, you can extend it to other things in a line method, but I don't do that for people just learning organic. So what does this mean? How many carbons are in that molecule? Well, count the bends. 
one, two, three, four, five, five garbins. You know something? I should share the fun. And the question is, how many carbons are in the molecule I just draw? True. Your turn. All the carbons in the molecule, not just in the ring. And when you're done, don't forget the vote. All right, my turn to have fun. You already had your fun. How many carbons are in this molecule? Well, the ring, how many in the ring? One, two, three, four, five, six. And then the carbons outside of the ring, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So the answer is there's 12 carbons in that molecule. A lot more hydrogens, but I didn't ask that. And that's a skill you should have. Oh, by the way, this will never be on a test, but do you ever wonder, is Dr. White really a organic chemist? Here's another ring that has one, two, three, four. Again, you don't have to copy this down. Five, six, seven, eight. Now, when I'm driving, and I come to a certain sign, I think of an eight-membered ring. It's called cyclooctane. And what sign do I see when I'm driving? When I think of cyclooctane, A stop sign. Whenever you come to a stop sign, I think, oh, a cyclooctane ring. Now you know I'm an organic chemist. That will not be on the test. Now, I taught you some reactions. Only two. I know many, many more. But the first one is combustion. And you should be able to put down the products, not the heat. But the products, when you take any saturated hydrocarbon, which is a molecule with only carbon-hydrogen atoms and carbon-carbon single bonds and oxygen, it reacts. You need a spark, but I don't put that down. You need, you get carbon dioxide, CO2, and water. And if you remember when you did the uh, investigating chemical reactions, you held a test tube over a flame of a candle and you saw some vapor form inside. That was the water from the combustion of the wax. In fact, do I have time? I do. I worked for one company, an Anglo-Dutch company that was headquartered in, you pronounce it G-O-U-D-A, Gouda. And that's the Dutch pronounce it Gouda. And the company I worked for was started about 1750 or something, and it took animal fat 
made it into a chemical that was used to make candles. And if you look downstairs in my family room, I have a very nice Delphi candle holder and a memorial candle. I think it was the 150th anniversary of the company. For those who don't know what Delphi is, Delph is a city in the Netherlands. Didn't realize you're going to learn a lot more than just chemistry in my class. And you see that on your screen. That's all Delft plow. I have a bunch of windmills, and I don't, and I have a bunch of much nicer plates than this of windmills that I got, and also was given. I have things like this from my time. I have some of that stuff too. There was this one gift shop in Amsterdam, and every time I'd go to Europe a couple times a year, I'd always fly out of Amsterdam. I'd spend a day or two in Amsterdam. If you've never been in Amsterdam, you don't know what you're missing. Great city. I have a bunch of these from KLM flights. They used to give them out free. Nicer ones than these. And after the second year where I'd been in this shop a couple of times, I'd walk in, he'd see me, He'd be with other customers. He had other staff. And he'd drop and come right over. How are you doing, Dr. White? Because he'd know I'd spend a couple hundred dollars, which was about seven or 800 guilders back then, because I'd buy souvenirs for myself, my friends, my neighbors, the people who worked for me. I spent a lot of money there. It was fun. All right, back to the review. So you should know if you're given a saturated hydrocarbon, what are the products? Next, I talked about a double bond, hydrogenation. And that's adding hydrogen with a catalyst to double bond. And you break one of the bonds and you add two hydrogen. And here's another way of writing that general reaction. Oh, excuse me. Now, in reactions like this, unlike combustion, do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No. I'll say that again. Unlike combustion, which is a rare reaction where you do break carbon-carbon single bonds, all the other reactions I know, just about all, you do not break carbon-carbon single bonds. So what does that mean in hydrogenation? I take this molecule and react it with hydrogen and palladium, or platinum in this case. What's the product? And how do you do that? You look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen atom? Should get your attention like that. Ooh, a double bond. And the rest of that are carbon, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, single bonds. And they're just going to come along for the ride. And the reaction, general reaction, double bond, hydrogen, a catalyst. And the catalyst can be platinum, which we're using in this reaction, palladium, or nickel. And you break the one of the two bonds, and each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. Now, do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No. So I have one, two, three, four across. I better end up with four across. On this carbon, I have a CH3 group called the methyl group. That still will be there. Notice here the two carbons of the double bond. I broke one bond, 
And my general reaction tells me each one will get a hydrogen. Now, how many bonds to carbon? Four. And therefore, I know how to put in the rest of the hydrogens. And this is a skill you should have. Now, I talked about a fatted oil. I'm going to skip this because I'm really on uh, the same thing here. I talked about beef fat being tallow, pig's fat, yellow grease, white grease. I'm going to skip that. However, I'm not going to skip this. You should know how soap works. And soap, you should be able to draw. Soap has this structure. a nonpolar tail, and a polar head. Whether it's the liquid or bar soap, it's the same thing. Or if it's your soap you use for your cleaning your dishes, soap you uh, detergent you use for cleaning your clothes, they all have Nonpolar tail, polar head. Now, the important piece of the puzzle, like dissolves like. That's the most important thing, how soap works. And you should know water is polar, dirt and grease are nonpolar. And they form a micelle. And the myself, we were to have a piece of dirt on your hand and it's magnified. The dirt being nonpolar attracts because of light dissolves light, the nonpolar tail of soap. And we call this a myself. I'll put a few more soap molecules. As you see in the picture here, it's totally surrounded. They cut off a section so you can see the dirt in the inside and the tails, but the outside of my cell is polar. And you should know how to draw a my cell. And now how does soap work? My cell looks. polar to water, and because of like dissolves like, water says to the micelle, I'm polar, you're polar, let's go down the drain together, and they do. And you should know this. Again, you should know the structure of soap. Nonpolar tail, polar head. The most important thing, key to how this works, is like dissolves like. And you should know water is polar, dirt and grease are nonpolar. And a micelle is formed with the soap and water and the dirt. The tails are attracted to the dirt because the light dissolves light. Both are nonpolar. The polar head wants to sail far away from the dirt molecule. And let me make this tea a little more tea-ish. Is that a word, tea-ish? Anyways, I just made up a new word in the English dictionary. Never mind. And now the micelle, which the dirt is slow, totally surrounded by the soap molecules where the polar heads are on the outside, looks polar to water, and the micelle and water now go down the drain together because the water says to the micelle, I'm polar, you're polar, let's go down the drain together, and they do.
Now, you should know, how does a towel work or paper towel? It's by hydrogen bonding to the water. And that's the end of the review for test number four. Now, I got a few minutes before, like a minute or so before our break. So it's time for a Dr. White story. Uh, my father was a pharmacist, but he loved chemistry. Gave me my first chemistry book when I was about eight. Wonder why I became a chemist. I don't know. But anyways, when I was about that age, he showed me something real neat. Now, I'm going to do some artwork, so don't break a rib laughing, please. When I was a kid, like about five or six, the most important thing going on in the world was the space race between the United States and the Russians, the Soviet communists. And anything that was a rocket was a great toy. Now, for a penny, and they were about this big, there was a hollow tube, and inside were these little dots of the worst candy in the world. And you took off the cap where it fins, so it looked like a spaceship, and you knew it was bad chem candy when a five or six or seven year old would open it and dump the candy in the garbage can and just play with the rocket. Well, after you dumped the candy out of here, the top part, if you turned it upside down, was a hollow tube that looked like a test tube. And my father taught me, if you put in the test tube some vinegar and baking powder, which is sodium bicarbonate. You slam the cap right on, back on, and what's happening, you have, and this you don't have to write down, this won't be on a test, but you did this for a lab. Take the vinegar, which is acetic acid, and the baking powder, which is sodium bicarbonate, and this is an acid-base reaction, and you get sodium acetate, which is dissolved in water, because this is acetic acid in water, which is also known as vinegar, which you learned on the airbag lab. You get water molecule form, but you get CO2 given off as a gas. And when you hold it like this, by the fins, the pressure builds up in here and the top part blasts off. When you're about six or seven, that's one of the neatest things in the world. My friends thought that was. Now, I have to tell you a bad part about the story. My best friend at the time, Dickie Dale, and decades ago, he moved out of Illinois and we lost touch. But when we were about six or seven, I was very close with him and his older brother. Uh, and they used up all their mother's baking powder doing this and didn't tell her. And she went to look for some to cook some with, like bake something, and she didn't. Her baking powder was all gone. Boy, did he catch it up. Boy, <laughs> did he get it. So if you use up all your mother's baking powder doing this, make sure you tell her to buy some more or you buy it for her. And with that, I thought I'd tell you that nice little story. I can still picture we'd stand out there and just go, boom. If your timing was right, it would go about four or five feet. When you were seven years old, that's impressive. All right, with that, let's take a five-minute break. 
I'll come back and do the organic problem set and some other neat stuff you should know about. I'll see you in five. I'm going to get up and stretch.
Oh, so yeah. Time to go. Time to get going. All right. Let's do the organic problem set now. And I apologize. I thought I got everything typed up, but I'll read this to you. What's a hydrocarbon molecule? A molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms. You should know. What's a saturated hydrocarbon molecule? A molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms and only carbon carbon single bonds. And you can use shorthand like I do. <clears throat> What's an unsaturated hydrocarbon unsaturated hydrocarbon molecule? It's a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms and at least one. This is a carbon carbon double bond or a carbon carbon triple bond. Now, how many bonds to carbon? Four. Now, a number five, put in the hydrogens. How do you know? There's four bonds to carbon. And let's look at B. The first carbon has one line or bond to it. Four minus one is three. That's why there are three hydrogens. The second carbon has two lines or, <clears throat> excuse me, bonds to it. Four minus two, why? Because there's always four bonds to carbon and the remainder are made up by hydrogens. So that's why there's two. Now, if I go down to this carbon, there's one line to it and four minus one is three. Why four? Because there's four four bonds to carbon. Same thing with this end one, one bond to it. Now let's go to this one. This is tricky. No, it's not. How many lines that carbon? One, two, three. There should be four bonds to carbon. Four minus three is one. And that's why there's one hydrogen. And the last carbon here, how many bonds to carbon? Four. I see two, four minus two is two. And you can see the same with the rest of those. But since it's, let's have the class have some fun time, Why don't you draw in all the hydrogens in this molecule, three points each? Your turn to have some fun. See how nice I am? Don't answer that. And remember, please be patient. Let's give everybody time to finish. For those of you at home, you can hit the pause button on the YouTube video if you need more time. And everybody's done. My turn. If we look at this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon, they all have one bond to it. Remember, there's four bonds to carbon, four minus one. So the remainder three are made of hydrogens. So I can do that, that. Oops, that's an awful looking, hold on. That, 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 and that. Those are all spoken for now. Oops, they want to do that. 
Oh no, I wiped out a carbon. All right, let's look at this carbon. How many lines to it? One, two, three. There's always four bonds to carbon. The remainder are hydrogen. Four minus three is one. So there's one hydrogen there. Let's look at this carbon right here. How many bonds to carbon are there? One, two, three, four. Count the lines. And how many bonds to carbon? Four. I bet some of you will have nightmares the next day or two. How many bonds to carbon? You'll see me doing this. I hope not. Four minus four is zero. So I don't have to put any more hydrogens on that one. Let's look at this carbon. How many bonds are there? One, two. There should always be four bonds to carbon. Four minus two equals two. So I put two hydrogens. And I have one more carbon to go. And that's this one right here. And how many bonds to that carbon? One two, three. Well, there should always be four bonds to carbon. Four minus three is one. And that's how you do it. Hope you had fun doing that. I did, but I'm an organic chemist. All right, next, how many carbons are in the following molecule? Well, if you see the letter C, that's a carbon. So in the first one, A, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I got that right. Yay, Dr. White. All right, now if we look at B, every bend in a line in a ring right here is a carbon. So how many bends in that ring? One, two, three, four, five, six. Then two more here, two carbons, eight, four more make 12. Now, if we look at this molecule, C, by the way, this is a cyclic ketone. Dr. White loves cyclic ketones. I did my PhD thesis on cyclic ketones and aldehydes. And my last patent dealt with ketones, not cyclic, but ketones. But how many carbon atoms are in that molecule? Well, count the bends in a line in the ring. One, two, three, four, five. And then the carbons outside the ring, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You don't count the oxygen because that's not a carbon. Oh, let's have some fun. This is an old friend of mine I haven't thought about in a while, but how many carbons are in this molecule? 2,3-dimethylcyclohexeno.
All right, how many carbons are there? Well, let's find out. Well, the ring has every bend of the line is a carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then this makes seven, it's a carbon. And this makes eight, that's a carbon. So there are eight carbons in that molecule. And this is a molecule I had to make that I used for my research when I got my PhD degree. So say hello to my old friend. Boy, it was an old friend of mine. In fact, the molecules I used to, this to make, don't, this one I'll never ask how many carbons are there. And this is an example of a molecule I made with my for my PhD thesis research. Now I'm really getting nostalgic. But anyways, let's do one more. And here's a molecule. How many carbon atoms are in that molecule? Your turn. And by the way, it's a molecule I just made up. I never made use this in my research. But it looks pretty. Now you know I'm an organic chemist. How many people you know look at a molecule and say it looks pretty? Because it is. <laughs> oh, I see someone already has the right answer. Yay for that person. And yay for all the rest of you. All right, everybody's done. How many carbons are in this molecule? Count the ring. Every bend in a line is a carbon. One, two, three, four, five. Carbons, letter C outside the ring. Six, seven, eight, nine. So it's five plus four nine carbons. Oops, that's an oxygen. And that's how you do that. And let's continue on with the practice problems. Now, the next one is circle the functional group or groups in the molecule, two or three points each. And a functional group is Anything that's not a carbon atom, hydrogen atom, or not a carbon-carbon single bond. So if we look at BA, here's an oxygen. These two carbons, it's called an ether, and I circle it. Here's another oxygen. You look for what's different. What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? What's not a carbon-carbon single bond? And here we have a carbon double bond oxygen and a hydrogen and a carbon, and this is called linaldehyde. Dr. White loves aldehydes too. And here, the CH3 is not a functional group, but OH, oxygen, hydrogen, and a carbon, that's called an alcohol. And here we have some more examples. But you know something? I'm going to let you have some fun. depending on my mood when I write the test later today.
oh, tonight at midnight, I'll be giving speed drawing lessons. No, I won't. Speaking about tonight, don't forget, if you need any help, All right, I think I threw everything in there but the kitchen sink. Oh, let's do a two for one Wednesday. I'll let you try two of them. The first one I made maybe a little too hard. But it's a practice problem, so I can do that on practice problems. All right, let's look at A. Now, look for what's different. Well, it's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon-hydrogen atom. That's going to be a functional group. A functional group is always bonded to carbon. Here's one that's called an alcohol. Here's another one that's called a ketone. Here's another one that's called an ester. Ooh, a double bond. And finally, a ketone. So I threw everything in there. There's one, two, three, four, five functional groups in a molecule, that molecule. Let's look at B. Remember, what's not a carbon atom or a hydrogen atom or a carbon-carbon single bond is a functional group and should get your attention like that. Ooh, three lines between two carbons. That's a triple bond. Oxygen atom between two carbons, we call that an ether, but I'm not going to ask you to learn the names. You take 1212 with me, or I also teach Chem 170, the same course at Elgin Community College. Uh, you'd learn this. By the way, the Chem 170 I teach at Elgin Community College this fall will be totally online like 1211. Uh, COD no longer does online organic. All right, let's go back to the problem set. Let's look at these reactions. And it's four points each. Give the reaction products or product for the following reactions. And what do we have here? A saturated hydrocarbon. How do you know it's a saturated car hydrocarbon? It only has carbon hydrogen atoms and carbon carbon single bonds. And it's reacting with oxygen. And the general reaction is saturated hydrocarbon, oxygen gives CO2 plus water. Here we have a ring, and I didn't put the answer down. Oh no, I better do that now. Must have been a tough night when I was doing the answers.
And the question is, give the product or products for the following reaction. Well, ring is this carbon hydrogens and carbon hydrogen single bonds. And that's a saturated hydrocarbon plus oxygen gives carbon dioxide plus water. And if you combust this, burn this, it's called cyclohexane, you'll get carbon dioxide plus water. You'll get heat, but that's not a molecule. But it's an important part of the reaction. All right, let's look at the next reaction, D. Look for what's different. What's well, not a carbon carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen atom? You get your attention like that. A double bond. We're reacting with hydrogen and nickel. H2 is hydrogen gas. And when you break, do that, you break one of the two bonds between those two carbons, and each of those carbons gets a hydrogen. You don't, oh, excuse me, break carbon carbon single bonds. So I have four carbons. I better end up with four carbons. I broke the bond. Each carbon gets a hydrogen. I put in the rest of the hydrogens because I know there's four bonds to carbon. And if I look at F, guess what? Double bond. Do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No. So I'll still have my ring and my two carbons, but I break one of the bonds and each carbon gets a hydrogen. Now, it's nine and 10 cross off. I forgot to do that. I'm not gonna ask you what tallow is or what yellow grease is, but it's beef fat and pig's fat. But I will ask you 11, how does soap work? Hint, give the structure of stop soap and talk about my cells. And here we have soap has a nonpolar tail and a polar head. Remember, water is polar, dirt is nonpolar. The most important piece of the puzzle, how soap works is like dissolves like. And because of that, the nonpolar tail is attracted to the nonpolar dirt. The polar head wants to be as far away from that dirt, and you form a micelle. And water sees micelle as polar, and they go down the drain together. And finally, how does a towel work? By hydrogen bonding to water. But you didn't know next time you wipe your hands off on a towel, you're doing chemistry. Yeah, which is why I always laugh when people say I hate chemistry. What they're really saying is they hate whoever taught chemistry to them, didn't make it fun like hopefully I'm making it fun for you. But think about it. Next time you dry your hands with a paper towel or with a regular cloth towel, you're doing chemistry. Hydrogen bonding to water off your skin to the towel. And that's how a towel works. Exciting, isn't it? All right, any questions about that, what I've gone over? All right, in our remaining time, let's do a couple of problems that I think will help.
All right. Let's do part of this problem stepwise, and I'll help you out. If the hydronium ion concentration, that's H3O plus in brackets, equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus fifth, then what is the pH of the solution and is an acidic, basic, or neutral? Now, remember, pH equal minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And if it's 1.0 times 10 to the minus X, then the pH is X. So the first thing is, why don't you write here what are you being asked to find and what are you given? We're going to do this stepwise. And when you figure that out, answer yes on the poll. What are you being asked to find? What are you given? All right. You're being asked to find a pH. What are you given? And if we look at important information, test number four, you'll see pH equal minus the log of hydronium ion concentration. And if the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus X, the pH is then X. So I'm going to let you try and figure out what is the pH of the solution and is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Your turn. And while you're doing that, don't forget, tonight at 7, I have my office hour. And if you need any help, please stop by. It's on Zoom. All right, everybody's done. My turn. Now, remember on test number four, show your work. You make a mistake, but you show your work. I can give you partial credit. If you don't show your work and make a mistake, I'll give you zero points. So we're trying to find a pH, and that's minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. We figured the hydronium ion concentration from the problem is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5. And when the log the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus X. The pH is X. In this case, X is 5, so the pH is 5. Now, you should know this scale. This I didn't put in important information. At pH 7, it's neutral. Above 7, it's basic. Below 7, it's acidic. And I hope you all know 5 is less than 7, so this is acidic. All right, let's do the same thing. But
All right, let's do it stepwise. First thing I'd ask you to do is what are you being asked to find and what are you given? And you're being asked to find the pH and you're given the hydroxide ion concentration equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus three. Hold on one second. I don't know who that is. It's not the president of the United States or the governor of the state of Illinois, not that they'll ever call me, but that's my Bluetooth phone hooked up to my cell phone. One more. Stop. Oh, it listened to me. All right. Now, remember, pH equal minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. Uh oh, we're not given that. So you need two steps. And this, I don't give to you. <laughs> that was a bad laugh. But first step, you take the hydroxide and you solve for hydronium ion concentration. Second step, you take the hydronium ion concentration and you determine the pH. Now, how do we do step number one? Well, you look at important information. Oh, wrong thing. Well, that was the right thing. Important information, test number one, number one, number four, and Hydronium times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. Hydronium times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And why don't you try and do step one? Remember, in important information, you're given this. Your turn. And let's be patient, give everybody time to finish. All right. So we want to go from hydroxide and determine the hydronium ion concentration. And how do we do that? Oh, what happened there? Hang on. My whiteboard is getting silly on me. Stop that. No, nope, did it again. I don't know why it's doing that, but. As I've mentioned, important information, hydronium times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. We want to solve for this. We'll need this gone. So how do I get rid of something? 
divide by it when you're multiplying two things. So I'll divide this side by hydroxide. Whatever I do to one side, I have to do the other. And I did. This cancels out. Remember, anything divided by itself equals the number one, cancels out. We're now left with that. I know what that is because we figured that from the problem, that's 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3. And you can use your calculator and divide, or I can do this in my head because I grew up with a slide rule. And that's what you get. Are we done? No. We're trying to find a pH. And second step, you calculate the pH from the hydronium ion concentration. Remember, important information, you have the pH equal minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. So your turn to do step number two. All right, my turn. We're trying to find the pH, and pH equals minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration, which we just calculated here. So we now know that's minus the log of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11, and when it's 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, the pH is x, in this case, x is 11. And then the next question is, is that acidic, basic, or neutral? And if we look at this right here, that you should know when the pH is 7, it's neutral. When it's below 7, it's acidic. And when it's above 7, it's basic. Well, I hope you all agree, 11 is above 7, so this is a basic solution. And let's do one more problem. Those are running out of time.
all right, since we're running out of time, I'm going to do this. What is the molarity of 324 milliliters of an HCL solution if you have to add 431 milliliters of a 1.76 capital M molarity KOH solution to neutralize the HCL solution? So we're trying to find the molarity of HCL. We're given, we have 342 milliliters of the HCL solution. And we also have one of uh, 431 milliliters of the 1.76 molar KOH solution. As soon as you see the word neutralize, that means it's a titration. And if you look at important information, test number four, moles of an acid equals moles of a base, which further can be written as milliliters of acid equal milliliters of base, molarity of base equals, let me say that again, milliliters of acid times molarity of acid equals milliliters of base times molarity of base. So is the titration And you should know hydrochloric acid is an acid. Potassium hydroxide is a base. So I can now write This. And we're trying to solve for this. So we want a loan on one side. So we'll divide that, this side, by 342 milliliters. of the HCL, whatever you do to one side, you have to do the other, and I will. This cancels out because anything divided by itself equals the number one, meaning it cancels out. And I'm left with my molarity of HCl equals 431 milliliters KOH times the molarity of KOH divided by 342 milliliters of the HCl. And notice milliliters cancel out. I'm left with molarity. And I'll now get my calculator, clear it, 431 times 1.76 divided by 342. And my calculator gives me this long number. Of 
times 10 to the zero, which is one. And remember on test number four, underneath your name, it'll say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And this is three significant figures. Oh, I'm in my rut again. Three significant figures. And this is three significant figures. And when you have a multiplication division, you get the same number of significant figures in your answer as the number with the fewest significant figures. Well, they're all three. So we have to round this off to three significant figures. Keep the two, keep the two, keep the one. Use the eight to round off. Is that four or higher or five or less? And hopefully I'll pick five or higher. So I'm going to drop all this, increase that by one. And the correct answer is 2.22 molar HCl. And that's how you do a titration. If I look at the clock, I'm done for today. I'm out of time. And we've covered just about everything that you should know and review for test number four. Remember, tomorrow, 8 a.m. or earlier, I will send out the password for the password protected PDF file for test number four. Make sure by 4 p.m. Friday, you have your answers uploaded as a single PDF file. If not, I could reserve the right to take off 50 points or up to 50 points. And don't forget, hand in labs. The amnesty program for past labs ends next Tuesday at 11.55 p.m. Also, Next Tuesday is the deadline, same time, 11.55 p.m., for the extra credit project. And I highly recommend, before you upload it by next Tuesday, email me your table, and I'll check it. If there's anything wrong, I'll let you know so you can fix it. That way, if you do the project, you should be able to get 10, 10. One, two, three, four, five, plus five more, 10 bonus prow points, which will help you great. With that, I'm done for today. Hope you had a fun time, and I'll see you tomorrow. Gain gazun. Goodbye.